read Revelation 13 this morning. Now we read Revelation 14. All of the 20 verses of Revelation 14. <coughs> and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him. For the hour of the judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters." There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name." Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle. And gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and 600 furlongs. Let's read again our text, Revelation 
14 verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. This morning, beloved, we saw the spiritual characteristics of the saints in Revelation 14, verse 12. Very appropriate spiritual characteristics over against eschatological foes, the beast, his false prophet, and image and mark, and spiritual characteristics which flow from eschatological comfort, the sovereignty of God who gives this power and authority to the beast, the eternal election of us and our being included in the Lamb and his redemption. And also, on the other hand, the eschatological comfort which flows from seeing what happens to those who give in, who worship the beast in the fire and the brimstone. So it is that God's people even in the anti-Christian kingdom, at the end, and through the ages, in whatever form or shape it takes, are patient, remaining under and enduring, keep the commandments of God, even where they clash with the commandments of man, especially when they clash, and cling to the faith of Jesus, which is the truth of the scriptures that he speaks by his Holy Spirit. The tonight's text, the next verse, speaks about death. And at first, that doesn't seem right. The text, when you read it, sounds like the sort of a text which would be well chosen for a funeral sermon. And you think to yourself, could that really be right? in the midst of an eschatological chapter and book like Revelation. And maybe you've heard Revelation 14, verse 13, preached at someone's funeral. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And when you look at the verse more closely, you think, no, I don't think in the context that is suitable. And after a while, when you look at it again more closely, you think, yes, that is, that is suitable. That does fit. And we'll, of course, see why in, in due course. <clears throat> but this word of God is not only, or even principally, for the comfort of mourners at a Christian funeral, Though, as I say, it serves very well. It is comfort for all the people of God and all of them right now. And the comfort, of course, is eschatological comfort. Comfort in the light of the end. When all things are made clear and we see things as they really are in light of the revelation that is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, then everything makes sense. Let's consider together, blessed are those who die in the Lord. The theme being taken from the main and central statement of the text. First the meaning, then the rest, and finally the reward. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. The meaning, the rest, and the reward. The text contains two words that I didn't mention in the title. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. And at this stage, this is worth mentioning too, the Church of Rome says, aha, purgatory. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Their argument is, 
The text is speaking about days that are close or very close to the Lord's second coming. And if you're aware of this aspect of Rome's teaching regarding purgatory, you'll see the significance of this. Because Rome believes that purgatory ends with the Lord's second coming. So Rome's three places, heaven, hell, and then the third one sneaked in between them, purgatory, will ultimately become two places because purgatory stops with the second coming of Christ. The argument then is, blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth because we're just about the second coming of Christ. If someone dies some days or weeks or months or years before the second coming of Christ, they're blessed because they won't have so long to spend in purgatory. It's a good job the minister said that for most of you because you never would ever have imagined that, but Rome has a greater imagination than you or I do. We need to understand too, while we're at it, that purgatory is a powerful object lesson in the development of false doctrine or heresy. It's a classic instance of slippery slope. A church makes one wrong practice or doctrine, and then in comes another wrong practice or doctrine influenced by that, another false doctrine, another false doctrine, until you build up a whole new heresy, and then that in turn spouts as many heads as a horrible Greek monster. The doctrine of the church. In the early days, there was the idea that church discipline for God's people was a punishment. A sort of payment for your sin. Uh-oh, that's wrong. The doctrine of salvation, your own good works are meritorious. They earn with God. And Jesus Christ's cross was a great and wonderful thing, but it only dealt with a certain, certain sort of divine punishment, but not all types of divine punishment. And then God, God's justice, God's justice can actually be appeased by man's own actions. And then in the field of the end times, these all, all these things locked together in individual eschatology, what happens a person after they die? Well then, the believer, if he hasn't done enough good works and he hasn't suffered for his own sins, temporal punishment, not eternal punishment now, a distinction without difference, and then after he dies, he's not bad enough for hell and he's not good enough for heaven, and therefore there must be a place where he can suffer more in flames and satisfy for temporal punishment. And here you are. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. From henceforth they have fewer days to spend in purgatory before they're released. Which to someone coming from the outside sounds terribly unfair. Because some guy that died 3,000 years ago, he may have 3,000 years of purgatory. And another guy with just as much debt to pay, he happens to die a week before the second coming of Christ. And he gets off light. It sounds like an unfair penal system. But two very quick and utterly unanswerable refutations of purgatory. The first is, the most obvious one without going into all the intricacies. There's no such place. No such place. Never found anywhere. And to conjure it up from henceforth, that's the work of a magician. The Bible says lots about hell. And this passage says it. We looked at it last week, verses 10 and 11. Two great images. The cup of the wrath of God, undiluted that God makes the wicked drink, that burns them within. And then the fire and brimstone, second image, burning them from without with the smoke of their torment ascending forever. And verses 14 through 20, we haven't reached them yet, say a lot about hell too. And the Bible has a lot to say about heaven 
and then heavens becoming the new heavens and the new earth and the eternal state, we will see shortly Psalm 73. And the last two chapters of the Bible deal with the new heavens and the new earth, just to mention a couple of easy ones. Purgatory doesn't exist. There only is. There only are two places. Heaven and hell. Dead place. And the second point is that Jesus Christ bore all the punishment for God's people. Bar none. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says that Christ being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins purged them and that's what purgatory is about a place for you to go and purge your own sins Jesus Christ by himself purged our sins all the sins of all God's people and then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high and he sat down because he had finished his work it was all done all the sins of God's people purged the punishment completely born. And that's why purgatory is a wicked aspersion upon the glory of Jesus Christ and a castigation of his complete and perfect work. Well, what does it mean? Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Well, you'll remember what we saw this morning. But the focus of Revelation 14, and indeed much of the book of Revelation, is on the days immediately prior to the second coming. This, of course, sheds light on the whole New Testament period between the first and second coming of Christ. I want to prove this to you again from the message of the three angels in verses 6 through 11. The first angel says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Very, very close to the end. Verse 8 says, second angel, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Very close to the end. And verse 9 says, third angel, if anyone worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or hand. There's the beast, the image is erected and the mark is being distributed all around the world. They're ruling it out and they're very efficient. So when Revelation 13 says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, it's saying there's a very short time to the final judgment from this perspective and with this focus. So that for these people, their time in the bliss of the intermediate state of heaven, joyous and wonderful as it is, is a very short period before they enter the greater bliss of the eternal state. So that those near to the end are especially blessed because even though heaven's wonderful, they don't have to wait, as it were, to the even greater glory of the everlasting kingdom. So I say the verse is still very suitable for a saint's funeral, beloved. And by the way, it's not that I've preached in this text at a funeral and I'm answering objections and people said, you know, Pastor, that wasn't quite the text you should have chosen. And it's not what I'm doing now. Verse 13, when it states, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, you can explain what from henceforth is. But the whole verse the voice from heaven, resting from their labors, their works do follow them, actually also, like so much of this chapter, apply to all the people of God in all their struggles. Here's the Heidelberg Catechism, speaking of the death of Christ. Question 42. Since then Christ died for us, why must we also die? Our death is not a satisfaction for our sins, you could just as easily say our death is not a punishment for our sins, but only an abolishing of sin and a passage 
into eternal life. And then this raises the next question. Why especially here is it stated that those who die in the Lord are blessed? We go back to the context. We're in the last of the last days. This is the perspective of the chapter. What do you think the beast is going to say of the martyred Christians? What do you think the propaganda of the second beast, the false prophet, will proclaim? Today, we slew a very worthy man, an upright Christian guy. He was a good citizen. He was an upright neighbor. And we also executed a few lovely believing ladies. It will be proclaimed far and wide, as it has always been by the false church, that the person who has been executed was an enemy of the state, a traitor against mankind, a blasphemer of the beast, and an accursed fellow who got everything that he deserved. Justice was served upon him. What did they say regarding the Apostle Paul in Acts 22, verse 22? Away with such a fellow, for it is not fit that he should live. That is, the oxygen in the air is too good for a guy like that to breathe. Mm -hmm. What did they say about Jesus Christ? Crucify him, crucify him. And if there must be a choice between him and Barabbas, who was a rebel and a murderer and a violent offender, a robber, well, by all means, Barabbas, he's a right fellow. But as for that Jesus, the cross is too good for him. That's what they said. And when Jesus said, the servant is not greater than his Lord, if they have hated me, they will hate you also. You should understand that it's not that Christians are going to be executed under the beast. And there'll be an official stenographer over here, sort of a Fox's Book of Martyrs author who has official access to the scaffold or whatever form it takes. And he's writing edifying thoughts that he's going to send off to the Christian press. And within a few weeks, He'd be publishing a new book. <coughs> this is the last beatitude in Matthew 5. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And Revelation 14 verse 13 is in that same stream of of witness started by our Savior in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. And we should notice too how this oracle is prefaced. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, because the voices from earth, the official propaganda of the anti-Christian state, is saying the exact opposite. But there's a voice from heaven which says the truth. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, put this down as a permanent record that they are blessed. This is what the Almighty from heaven says so that everybody can see and hear and read this because this is the truth no matter what they say. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Let me give you some famous examples in church history. Ignatius, who was martyred in the early second century. Emperor Trajan, of course, a paragon of virtue, called Ignatius a wicked devil. And he threw him to the lions in the Roman Colosseum, attendance like a large premiership football ground, 45,000 as a wicked devil to be torn in pieces by the wild beasts. 
Jan Hus was specially dressed up with curses and so on his garment and a heretic's hat upon his head and declared to be an execrable, vile fellow and then burned at the stake in Constance in southern Germany. And the same Martin Luther in the 16th century, a hundred or so years later, though to us and to many of his contemporaries was the most loved man in Europe, was on the other hand, and for exactly the same reason, also the most hated man in Europe by the Church of Rome. Things were polarised. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, doesn't matter what the Council of Constance said or Emperor Trajan, write, write this. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Man may curse them, but they are blessed. That's the declaration of heaven. And that's enough for us. Blessed. Let me give you the first line of three psalms. I could have chosen more, but I stopped with three. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That man is blessed. Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He's blessed. Psalm 128. Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. Blessed. That's what God says. That's what we must think. And I want to give you now the seven blesseds in the book of Revelation. And you may now choose to close your eyes and just think about the words that are spoken to you without dozing off. It's these blessings are yours too by faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Blessed readers and listeners. 16 verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Blessed are those who are watching for the Lord's return. 19 verse 9. He saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God, those invited to that wedding feast. Chapter 20, verse 6. <clears throat> Blessed and holy is he that is part in the first resurrection, the resurrection of the soul at death. And chapter 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly, says Jesus. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And our text, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. The only one of those seven uttered by a voice from heaven against all the clamor of the wicked cacophony on earth. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. And there are all sorts of things that people can die in. People can die intestate. People can die in pain. People can die in a nuclear explosion. Tens of thousands of people have. People can die in their bath, in their bed, in their spouse's arms. We read that scripture in scripture that Abraham died in a good old age. 
and that many Israelites died in the wilderness. And when the second vial is poured out in Revelation 16, verse 3, every living soul died in the sea. The little preposition in is very versatile. But ultimately, though a person can die in all sorts of situations or circumstances, there only are two options. You either die in your sins, and Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins, or you die in the Lord, as our text speaks of. And if you die in the Lord, it doesn't matter, context, Revelation 14, if you die in jail or at the hands of the beast. And though I don't know the future, I would guess that the deaths of many of us, particularly the older ones, are not likely to be particularly heroic. So that for us, if we die in the Lord, in our sleep, or on a hospital bed, or in a care home, or if we die in the Lord of cancer or of COVID, we'll be all right. So that it doesn't really matter, although we all have our preferences, no doubt, when we die or where or how, just as long as we die in the Lord. And everything outside of dying in the Lord is terrifying. And those who die in the Lord are the same people who before the foundation of the world were chosen in the Lord and redeemed in the Lord and quickened in him too. We are the ones who believe in Christ and therefore we live in Christ and therefore we die in Christ. We're dealing here with union with Jesus Christ. All our life long in Jesus and then we die in Jesus. And being in Christ, we are united to him by the Spirit, Godward, and we're united to him by faith, that bond that reaches up from us to God that he established. And so it is, in essence, the same as to die in faith. These all died in faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they died in faith, not having seen the promise, Hebrews 11 verse 13 says, but being persuaded of it, they were convinced and convicted. Dying in faith is dying in the Lord. And those, of course, who die in the Lord will forever be with the Lord, and they will never be damned. Yea, said the Spirit, Continuing the thought, blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. And apart from the utterances by the Spirit in the letters to the seven churches, in Revelation 2 and 3, there only are two places in this last book of the Bible where the Spirit is said to speak like this. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Come in your second bodily coming. And the Spirit works this prayer in the church. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Holy Spirit says this. He says this through the prayers of the church. Come. Come quickly. So the Spirit here speaks of and generates prayers to this effect that Christ comes from heaven to his church on earth. Well here in Revelation 14 verse 3 the other instance 
It speaks about the church coming to Christ in heaven at our deaths. And this again teaches the general important truth regarding the Holy Spirit that he is the great personal bond, not only between the Father and the Son, but between Jesus Christ and his church. So that the Spirit works the prayer, come Lord Jesus, so that Christ will then come to the church. Revelation 22. And here the Spirit speaks about the church coming to Christ at death. So at one way or another, the Spirit who joins the two parties of Christ and his church will bring them together in an ever deepening union because he is that personal bond in God, the Trinity, and between Christ and his church. The Spirit, of course, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. The Spirit, of course, is the one who enabled us to do the labors. Otherwise, the labors would be too onerous and we would have caved in long ago. The Spirit is the one who also made these labors good works that please Almighty God. Because the Spirit works faith without which everything is sin. And the Spirit works conformity in us and our works to the law of God. And the Spirit creates the desire in us to honour our Heavenly Father. And now the same Spirit comes to the church and soothes us, saying to us, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours. He says, these are the labors for which I fitted you. These are the labors that I strengthened you to perform. And these are the labors that ultimately I even perform through you. And now they're over. And you can rest from them. You don't have to do them again. They're finished. They're over. And labor here is work, first of all but it's more than work. It is work which involves struggle and pain and grief and agony, the sort of work that you can never get your children to do because they're so easily discouraged. The first little bit of hardship, they pack it in. That's right too, isn't it? Yep. But painful work, toiling work, laboring work, the sort of work you have to make a real effort or else you quit. And this passage has the Spirit saying to us, you will rest from your labors. And you hardly need reminding at this point, because you're beginning to understand this chapter and its context, in chapter 13 and 14, the laboring to be patient and remain under, under persecution in an anti-Christian kingdom, that's painful. The labor to keep the commandments of God and not to yield to Babylonian idolatry or not to rebel against anti-Christian tyranny by taking up arms or revolting or rioting. Laboring to persevere in the faith by holding on to all the truth of Scripture, maintaining the Reformed Confession, buying the truth and selling it not, even in the anti-Christian kingdom, when you cannot buy or sell food or goods. And the Spirit says, you will rest from your labors. Now, I don't want to sound ungrateful for my own work or labors. I don't want to be, which is even worse, ungrateful for my work or labors. Not that I'm saying they're not special. And I hope that you aren't ungrateful and that you enjoy the calling which God gives you. But all that understood, I think we can all say that rest from our labors appeals to us. It sounds good. Now, in this instance, it doesn't sound good because we're lazy, although we may be lazy and we may be shirkers. 
But here it is deliberately meant to sound good. So you can give yourself over to this text and say, oh, I like the sound of that. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. God holds out to us this pleasant experience that we will face no more tiredness, no more opposition, no more pain, no more suffering, and no more rejection. Yea, saith the Holy Spirit himself, that you may rest from your labors. That's to encourage us to hang in there and to persevere despite the hardships and persecutions even when they get fiercest. But one day we're going to rest from our labors and then one day we're going to think just exactly what 2 Corinthians 4 says, you know, our light affliction, which was but for a moment, it worked for us a far more exceeding weight and glory of glory than we ever understood. And there we are, resting from our labors, while those who worship the beast and who boast that they have got all of life sorted, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night. Those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. So that when we die in heaven, and in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no painful labor, never mind eternal punishment. But instead, we will work, but we work without any labor, and we will work as Christ's servants, a work which is blessed and joyful and meaningful. We'll work out of a sanctified heart in everlasting gratitude and praise. That's the sort of work that we'll do. And now more briefly, beloved, we move finally to the blessed reward for us and for all who die in the Lord. Notice with me that the text does not teach that we, when we die, follow our works, with our works going before and then we coming in second place. If the text said that, it would teach that our works then would pave the way into God's presence. So that would be salvation by works. That we do these works and we follow our works and we, on the basis of these works, are accepted by God. The truth is that Jesus Christ is our forerunner who has entered within the veil and then he, in the, intermediate, in the immediate presence of God, the one who's gone before us, we are in him, and then we follow him to be with him where he is at death. So here's the order. Christ goes first, then we at death follow him, and then as the text says, our works do follow us. And our works, when we die, because we don't go to heaven without the good works we've wrought as believers, our works follow us as works for which we will be rewarded. The unbeliever, when he dies, he dies in his sins. And his works follow him too. You can't get rid of your works. They necessarily follow you. And for these works, he's going to be punished. For we die in the Lord and our works follow us too. But this isn't for our damnation. This passage, like so many others, is dealing what the Reformed, following Augustine, have well referred to as the reward of grace, which is something which the carnal mind cannot understand. And when it hears reward, it thinks, oh good, I've earned something with God. No. Here's how it works. God predestines us before the foundation of the world. That's called election. God also predestinates us in his all determining purposes with our good works. Then God comes and regenerates us in time. He renews our wills so that we are willing in the day of his power. We then walk 
in absolutely all of the good works which he ordained for us and we never miss a single work that he has appointed on our pathway. It's all determined by God's providence and his inwardly working grace. And then God sees the good works, noticing the sin in them, of course. And if we can see the sin in our good works, and it doesn't take a microscope to spot it, God certainly can. He then forgives all the sins in our works on the basis of Christ's sacrifice out of his own infinite mercy. And then, having washed away all the filthy bits, as it were, he sees all the good in our works and he turns to us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Though all the good in the good works was wrought by his own grace. And then he says, here's all the good things that you did. I'm going to reward you for my work in you, for all the good works you performed by my grace in you, I'm going to reward you very, very richly, more than you could ever imagine, and in fact, more than we would have thought possible in keeping with God's justice without charging him with any unrighteousness. And the reward, therefore, is all of grace, and it's all of grace just as much as our election is of grace, and our redemption is of grace, and our justification is of grace, so it is all of grace alone. And this is what the Christian hears, this voice from heaven, the speech of the Holy Spirit. By faith we receive this. I heard a voice from heaven at church tonight. And what did it say? First of all, John, well, it said to me, right, blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, nodding his head as it were, that they may rest from their labors and their works <coughs> do follow them. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou would quicken our faith, that the word of God may be sharp like a two-edged sword to us despite our sloth we ask that we may remember these things and that they would encourage us that we do not labor in vain. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.